<clears throat> All right. Well, it could always be worse. Amen. You could have been the one who smashed your finger <laughs> in the door. <laughs> Let's look at Acts chapter 13. And uh, where we left off was about verse 12. I think we read verse 13, but we'll read it again. But um, just to, to bring us up to speed, uh, we're looking at the first missionary journey of Paul. And that's the title of the message, too. Uh, the first, or Actually, it's Paul's first sermon that we're going to look at tonight, but it's within this first missionary journey. Um, they sailed in verse 4, Acts chapter 13, verse 4, uh, they went to and sailed to Cyprus, and um, Barnabas was with Saul, who will later become Paul, um, and actually he's already become Paul at this point in our story. Um, but Barnabas was from Cyprus, and that's most likely why they picked up his relative, uh, John Mark, who was actually sent with them as a, uh, a helper um, at the end of verse 5. It says John was their minister, but also um, that's the same guy at the very last verse of Acts chapter 12, whose surname was Mark. So that's John Mark, the writer of uh, the Gospel of Mark. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the guy that wrote the book of the Gospel of Mark. Um, and he go, he comes and joins up with Barnabas. Uh, we talked about him in that term for minister at the end of verse 5 is an under rower and how important it is for under rowers. They're not seen, but the ship can go nowhere without them. Um, and that's the way it is in the ministry, the way it is for any functioning uh, ministry, whatever it is. There's going to be things that need to be done behind the scenes, um, things that need to get done, practical things. You're not going to get the accolades, the pat on the back by humans because they don't know that it's you that did it. Uh, but God sees you. He sees the under rower, the guy that's... Uh, putting it all the work, um, and it's, it's not a, uh, in this life, on earth, it's not rewarding, um, but we're going to see in heaven how, how many scrubbed toilets in churches faithfully, and they're going to be rewarded beyond any of our wildest dreams. Um, we're going to wish that we did it. <laughs> And it's, it's important for us to keep that in mind. And I think that's, I, that just jumped out at me in studying through it last week, that under rower um, and just what John Mark was to them. Now, John Mark has his flaws. Um, we're going to come up later on in Acts chapter 15. He's kind of a cause of this dispute that turns up between Saul and Barnabas. Um, and there's some debate as to why that is. Uh, and actually, at the end of verse 13, where we pick up tonight, uh, now, verse 13 of Acts chapter 13, when Paul and his company uh, loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John, departing from there, from them, returned to Jerusalem. So, for whatever reason, John Mark... Uh, went back to Jerusalem, and most speculate that he didn't like that Paul now, because he's mentioned his name comes before Barnabas, he has the more prominent and leading role now. And uh, it's Psalm, Psalm 75, 7. Because if that's the case, and again, it's just speculation, we don't know for sure if that's why John Mark departed, went back to Jerusalem, but if for some reason he got kind of um, bent out of shape that Paul, who wasn't his relative, he, he was either 
John Mark was either Barnabas's cousin or his nephew. Either way, he was, he was related to him and was dear to him. But in Psalm chapter 75, 7, it said, God is the judge. He puts down one and sets up another. That's what he's doing in the book of Acts with Barnabas and Saul, with Paul, the apostle. Paul is now getting, and, and he <laughs> looked at a wizard. Remember the story? It's really fascinating. Last week, uh, the beginning, Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 12, is an exciting little uh, story of them being used by God in a mighty way. And Paul looks at this wizard, this, this uh, um, sorcerer, and, has, and strikes him blind. And Paul has some amazing abilities that God gives him. Imagine being able to strike somebody blind. You know, just God gives you the ability to do that. Now, it was for a season that this sorcerer who was causing problems, and actually what's interesting about the sorcerer that I meant to make note of is all he, he, was, he wasn't doing any magician tricks, wasn't doing anything like that. He was trying to do anything to keep this governor, Sergius Paulus, from hearing the word of God. That's all the enemy wants to keep you from doing. If he can do that, he's got you. And the sorcerer is, uh, and last week when we looked at that, um, that's, that's all he was trying to do. And so, of course, Paul being used by God, it's the first miracle that Paul does is strike this guy blind. Um, and God, it's always important to point out, God would have done it with or without Paul. Um, God is just that powerful. And so, uh, so getting back to Barnabas, uh, Mark, John Mark being kind of upset that Barnabas was now, uh, the, in verse 13, just Paul's company um, instead of the leading guy. Uh, if it weren't for Barnabas, by the way, Paul wouldn't have been received by the early church. Barnabas was used to kind of warm up people to this murderer. <laughs> That's who Saul of Tarsus was, remember? The guy that was persecuting and beating probably much many of these people's friends and family, uh, the early church. And here Barnabas is used by God for, uh, for them to receive Paul. And Paul uh, is now going to be the one God decides to use and it begs the question, why does God use any of us? God can use rocks and donkeys. It's a miracle He uses me. Or, and He can use you. He can use anyone. Um, that's another thing that I meant to mention more of. Last week was a heavy study. <laughs> because we talked a lot about this sorcerer and all that. And then before that, though, was the ministering to the Lord. If you remember how important it is for us to minister to the Lord, we're not doing it for men's applause, for recognition, or for rewards. Um, and the exciting thing about that is any one of us can do it, minister to the Lord. Not all of us can preach a sermon. Not all of us can teach the Sunday school class. Not all of us can deal with teenagers. Not all of us can are gifted in these different areas. Not all of us can build houses. Not all of us can fix cars. But any one of us can just minister to the Lord. Just spend time praying. Spend time singing to the Lord. Spend time in His Word. Man, it just pleases the Father's heart. He just wants to spend time with you. His children. He wants to be ministered to, you know, by you. And it's so important for us to, you know, you think of the word minister, and the world has taken it, and all you think right away is a career. Somebody's a minister, so that means that's a career. No. <laughs> if, if they are true ministers, it's before the Lord. They're doing it as unto the Lord. Um, and it's, it's a way to keep from getting depressed, <laughs> If you truly minister to the Lord and do what you're doing 
unto the Lord and not for men, not to, to uh, get any kind of applause, um, you're not going to be uh, susceptible to um, depression. So verse 13, they are now, uh, John departs from them, but, verse 14, uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 14, but when they departed from Perga, and they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and sat down, and after the reading of the law, and the prophets and the rulers of the synagogue uh, sent unto them, saying, Ye men uh, and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Have at it. Now, that is an invitation, a little cracked door that Paul is going to just drive a truck through. Um, this Paul was the wrong guy to do this to, to just open up the door. But this was a common thing they did in the synagogues. They had, and we're going to learn there was Gentiles present in the synagogues at this time. Um, again, something to be sensitive to in the book of Acts is the, the distinction of Jew and Gentile because one of the mysteries of the church is us, the Gentiles, coming in and being a part of the Jews and the, the faith, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with... Uh, Anything like that, um, God actually completely abolishes, completely does away with any uh, kind of partiality, whether male, female, slave, free, Jew, or Greek, in Galatians 3.28. Um, we are all one in Christ. Not we are all one uh, because of this political leader. Or we are all one because uh, we've been taught now not to be racist. That's foolishness. I'll say it, and I've said it before, that is a deception and lie that's going on in our nation that you can teach somebody to not be racist. That's silly. It truly is. The only way and the only cure for any, and it's not just racism, it's sexism, it's... it's uh, any kind of partiality where you're putting down uh, somebody for having some kind of physical uh, deformity, <laughs> whatever it may be. Christ, when we're in Christ, the two most important words I would argue in the entire Bible, in Christ. When you truly are in Christ, you know, <laughs> there by the grace of God go I. I should be deformed. I should be this or that. What makes me any different? And we all know that when we understand that. Paul is going to go on and he'll be the one to say, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the chief one. You know, Nobody else can take that because Paul wrote it down. <laughs> I'm the worst among you and God saved me. Um, it's silliness. The world um, has been trying to they look at the church and the mystery of the church again is that here we've got old people, young people, uh, smelly people, clean people, um, and we're all happy together. That's the church. Why? <laughs> it baffles the world. They've been trying to do it for centuries. <laughs> let's, let's do this in our own strength. Let's, let's, in fact, let's make it a mandate. Let's, let's set a law in place and that way... It'll really cause them. No. What do laws do? You put up a sign on your front lawn that says, don't step on the grass. Guess what happens? People step on the grass. People that never thought about doing it before are now racist because all we're hearing about is racism. All we're hearing about is this or that or the other. Um, it, it just, what man, when humans get their dirty, grimy hands on something, it only makes matters worse. This is another reason it's so important for us to be in God's Word and not on Facebook, not on our local news channel, because you, again, are going, and we're all, uh, without the Word of God, we are all susceptible, we are all vulnerable to the deception, the great deception that's among us. 
And it's only going to get worse. Can I have someone say amen? Because I feel terrible up here right now. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't feel that bad. I, it's the Lord. It's God's Word. This is what will inoculate you amen. to the incredible injustice and incredible lies that is is so prominent and uh, so prevalent, not prominent, prevalent in our culture. So, after the reading of the law, this was a common thing in the synagogues, verse 15, to look and see if there were any newcomers. And Paul would have happened to be, in Barnabas, there, a newcomer in this area. So an open door. And verse 16, I'm guessing without flinching, Paul stood up, verse 16, and beckoning with his hands, said, Men of Israel, and ye that fear God. Again, that indicates there are Gentiles in the audience. And he says, Give audience, that the God of this people, of Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an high, high arm brought them brought he them out of it, and about the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. I'll say, that's an understatement. God suffered them with their manners, their attitude. And if you ever wonder what it means in the wilderness, go to the book. The, the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, the original name of, of the book is in the wilderness. So when you see that phrase in Scripture, and it speaks of the Israelites, the time that they were in the wilderness, and you go, what does that mean? You can go to the book of Numbers, and you can read all about what it's talking about, their time in the wilderness. And originally that book was was called In the Wilderness. Uh, And God did (laughs) suffer with them and their attitudes. Verse 19, And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of uh, Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. Um, Again, that uh, is a reference to the book of Joshua. In fact, just in three verses, he goes from Genesis to Judges, actually into 1 Samuel. Um, And we'll talk a little bit about that. But that's verse 19 is a reference to the uh, book of Joshua. Verse 20, And after that, he gave them up to Judges, there's the next book, about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. There's 1 Samuel. And afterward they desired a king, still 1 Samuel. And God gave them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony. And said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And of this seed, uh, of David's seed, has God, according to his promise, raised unto us, uh, unto Israel, a Savior, Jesus. Now he gets to what it's all about. And just from Paul's small little, uh, you know, summary of the Bible, the Old Testament, he brings it right down to what it's all about, and that's Jesus Christ, verse 23, right? To his promised, uh, he raised unto us, uh, unto Israel, a Savior, Jesus Um, And then he goes on to elaborate and to really define what others have uh, said. Uh, When John had first preached, that's John the Baptist, before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John fulfilled his course, he said, Whom think ye that I am? Who am I? I am not he. Remember, John the Baptist said that. But behold, there comes one after me whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, 
to you is the word of this salvation sent. In other words, the gospel is has come and has always come to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And uh, he's, he's getting specific now. Children of the stock of Abraham, verse 26. Um, that, that is getting specific to those who would know what he's talking about. Um, starting way back in the land of Egypt, coming out of Egypt, going through to Saul, the, the first king of Israel, and into David, the chosen king of Israel. And then now he's going to really hammer it home and hope that they get it. <laughs> Which, um, verse 27, For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, they didn't understand what the prophets um, Isaiah and, and uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, which are read every Sabbath day, by the way, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Um, and though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. The tree is a reference to the cross. Uh, verse 30, But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them, uh, which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are, his, of, um, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, or the good news, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he raised, uh, he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he also said in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. We just read that last Sunday night, Psalm 16. I think it's the last verse, near the last verse of Psalm 16. Verse 36, For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell, asleep, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Uh, in other words, David died. He's no longer with us. You can go to his tomb and see that he's still dead. <laughs> but he whom God raised, verse 37, saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Another important thing to note there. What is Jesus all about? What was everything that Paul was preaching about? It's the forgiveness of of sins. Verse 39, By him all that believe are, ju are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware therefore, lest, thou, uh, lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers, and wonder and perish. For I work a work in your day, a work which ye shall not, shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. <laughs> and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of of God. We'll stop there tonight. I think that's enough, don't you think? I love, I absolutely love Paul's first sermon. Because it reminds me, and it should remind all of us, how important the whole Bible is. You see, he didn't have the book of Romans to go to, which is great reading, by the way. It's, it's the gospel summed up. The book of Romans is so powerful because it's so brief. 
and we're so able to just read through it. But when you look at a book like Leviticus or Deuteronomy or Numbers or even Genesis for that matter, it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of knowledge, a lot of things, a lot of information, one might say. But the subject matter is the same. That's what's so powerful. That's what's so awesome. And that's what Paul is making abundantly clear in Acts chapter 13 here with his first sermon. Starting at the time that they would come out of exile in Egypt. Out of the, or rather, the time that they would come out of slavery in Egypt. The whole thing is a picture of you and me. We were in slavery, in bondage, in sin. Egypt is a type of the world. That's what's so fascinating. The Old Testament is a picture book. We're going to see that in reality um, even more so this Sunday morning in my probably one of the most important chapters of the whole Bible, Genesis chapter 22. A man named Abraham, you all know the story, takes his son Isaac and takes him up on Mount Mor uh, Moriah and there is ready to offer his son by killing him to, and it's his only son and that's in the words of the Father of God um, and offer him up and it's, a, it's this perfect picture and in a way Paul is, is laying this out that um, we too were in Egypt as strangers um, without a home, without a purpose, uh, not really knowing why we were created. We were maybe asking the question, why am I here and what am I made for? What, what's my purpose? And God not only sends, uh, gets them out of Egypt, but uh, they go into, you go get into the book of Joshua eventually, and they're conquering. They're in the book of Joshua, battle after battle. The promised land is not heaven. If you ever think that or are told that, knock it down because there are no battles in heaven. And that's what they do when they enter into the promised land. There's, there's even old gospel songs that sing about the promised land being heaven. And that's just not right. It's not theologically or doctrinally sound. Um, uh, because, and one way we know that for sure, is because it's battle after battle. And they're conquered, and there's sin in the camp um, with Achan in the book of Joshua. And it's a great picture of you and I in our uh, victorious Christian living. Meaning, we, we struggle with sin, and then we're victorious over it. And we don't think you, you're done. Okay, I'm done sinning. No, you struggle again, and then you're victorious over it. And then uh, you end up, God ends up shining the flashlight over here in this closet. Oh, wait a minute, I never even realized that was there. And it, oh, don't look in here, this is the, the secret chest that I always keep closed and locked. And God shines His light. What does the light do? It exposes our dark hearts. The, gen, uh, the Jewish nation, understand this, the Jewish nation, the Israelites, Joshua in the land of the enemies, in the land of the Canaanites, and in, going into the promised land, they were a flashlight, a beam of light. And they're just, everyone can't stand them. To this day, the nation of Israel is a light to, the nation, to all nations around, the Gentiles. In fact, that's the Old Testament. I can't take credit for that. They would be a light for the Gentiles to turn to. The Gentiles could see, oh, that's truth. And Jesus would come along and describe the light. I am what? The light. Jesus is the light of the world. And so, the enemy can't stand the light. 
the darkness in your own heart can't stand the light. And you have incredible uh, battles being fought, and, and I just love the way Paul, and it's, it's very similar to what we looked at in Acts chapter 7 um, with Stephen. Remember, Stephen was even t- getting more in detail. <laughs> and and uh, he knew the Old Testament very well, and so did so did Saul of Tarsus. We're going to see uh, more on on this because he he uh, was very long winded, uh, so much so where a man will fall asleep and die in the middle of Paul's sermon. <laughs> so we'll get to that. Yeah, the Book of Acts is exciting too, isn't it? Yeah. There's, there's all kinds of stuff that happens. This guy falls out of the window because he fell asleep and he dies. So next time you think of falling asleep during church, be warned. And we'll get to that story. But uh, the, I love that his focus ends up on Christ. But it's not just, there was this man named Jesus that taught us to love one another you know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people that just claim to be religious or go to church or do this or do that, and they really honestly, sincerely, from the bottom of their heart, believe that if I just treat everyone nice, I've, I'll, I'll be safe. I'll go to heaven. If I just, and they call it the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do to you. If we just do that, then we're good. No! (laughs) That's empty. That's wrong. That's a nice gesture. But, you know, um, the the worst of humankind, the very worst, you know, the murderer, the child molester, the rapist, whatever heinous crime is just as bad as you if you're holding on to I just do unto others as I would have them do to me and that's going to get me into heaven and that's enough for me no you are just as bad if not you could even be worse why because you don't even see it you're blinded by your own goodness or your own religiosity, whatever it may be, your own righteousness has blinded you from the fact that what we need is Jesus in place of me on the cross. His death. There was, and, and what Paul is getting at, what he goes into detail about, is how the prophets fulfilled, uh, the, them putting Jesus to death was fulfilling all of the prophecies that were being read over and over and over again. They would read these things, like as a lamb led to the slaughter, he would not open his mouth. Or that he would be cut off from the land of the living. The Messiah, the Son of God, the, the chosen one of, uh, and the Savior of the world. That's who Jesus is. God is my salvation, is uh, the Savior. That's what Jesus, the name Yeshua, or Jesus, which is just the Greek name for Yeshua, um, that's what that name implies, is God is salvation. In other words, He saves. You cannot save yourself. And we over and over and over, we fall into the trap, and it, it even creeps in to our hearts, thinking, no, I I got this. I can do it myself. I know the right words to say. I know the right formula. I know how many chapters to read through a day. Whatever it may be. (laughs) If it's not a relationship with God, and if you're not focused on the fact that all of the prophets spoke of what? Jesus coming. And that is an even more exhausting Thing you can you can exhaust that as much as you want. Why? Because there was a first coming, that every prophecy was fulfilled perfectly to the T, to the hour. The very day that Jesus rode in on that donkey, 
into Jerusalem and the people, Palm Sunday we call it, they laid their palms and their clothes out and uh, they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. That was a fulfillment, a very specific fulfillment of a very specific day. But that's just Jesus' coming, His first coming. Then, Paul goes on, doesn't he, that he would die. Well, it's okay, we can just talk about Jesus coming. No, you need to talk about Jesus coming and that he died. Why? Because by his death, sin can be forgiven. It's only because he laid down his life. He could have came and the, the enemy was right there saying, just bow down and worship me. I'll give you all the world. I'll give you all the kingdoms. Everything. He was, he was there in the garden. <laughs> He was, he was tempting Jesus over and over and over and looking for a more opportune time to just tempt Him. To do what? To not go to the cross. To make there be another way. And there was no other way. Jesus even said, Father, if there were any other way, let this cup, cup pass. And there was no other way. Not only that He died and that our sins are forgiven, Jesus came, He died, but then He was buried. The burial. He would be buried in a rich man's tomb. Again, every (laughs) prophecy is specific. That very thing that he would be buried in Joseph of Arimathea. A wealthy man's tomb. Now he just borrowed it. But he he was buried. I like the... I forget who coined the saying. Jesus was the only one who could... Treat the tomb like a hotel room. Only needed for three days. Only needed for the weekend. And it's true. He's the only one who could treat the tomb like a hotel room. Um, And he would be, he would come, he would die, and then he would be buried. But that's not it, is it? (laughs) That's not all. He's also raised up to newness of life. 1 Corinthians 15 is your homework assignment. And it'll last all week. It's a long chapter. 1 Corinthians 15 will let you in on that very thing. This, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're coming up on Easter pretty soon. But for, for the believer, for the one who studies the Bible daily, Easter's every day. <laughs> resurrection Sunday is every day. I also don't like the term Easter that much because it's Resurrection Sunday. And you you all have heard the story behind behind Eshtar. You could do your homework on that, but that's a sermon for another day. Um, A little something to offend everybody tonight. Anyway. (laughs) But... It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was raised from the dead. This is the very uh, power of our faith. Without it, it's nothing. Jesus is alive. Jesus was, he burst forth out of the tomb. Death could not hold him down. And he's only the first fruits of that. So it's, he came, his first coming was specifically uh, prophesied about his death, again, that he would be buried and, uh, and that he died. But not only that, that he was raised up again, the story still does not end there. Because Jesus Christ is coming again. The very uh, prophecies concerning his first coming, there are twice as many concerning His second coming. Which, if you haven't heard this, get to know it, because when Jesus came first, He came as a lamb. A suffering servant. A lamb. And John the Baptist saw Him at His first coming and said what? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's coming again as a lion. A conquering king. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Book of Revelation, right? 
You can ask Dad after for a chapter and verse there. <laughs> but the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one that would, would come and rule and reign and annihilate all world kingdoms, all worldly thrones. This is so important that we get it because he, all other kings died. And Paul said that. David, yeah, he was a great king. And that's a whole other sermon there. I thought about talking a lot more about how we're, we're told that David was a man after God's own heart right here in Acts chapter 13. And that is a whole another mind-blowing when you know who David was, the kind of guy that he was. Um, and, and again, when you know the kind of guy that Saul was, you understand, okay, David was a man after God's own heart. Saul was a man after Saul's own heart. Saul was a man who went for what he wanted. <laughs> and... and uh, whether they're kings, whether they are political leaders, presidents, uh, whoever they may be, Paul would say the same thing today, and I say the same thing. They die. You can go and visit their grave. Jesus is alive. He's been raised from the dead, and he's coming back <laughs> to completely put everything where they ought to be. Um, the whole world groans. You know, we we uh, desire, uh, me and Jess having this baby on the way, um, God continues to remind me. You know, she could, she could go into labor right now at this point. You know, I'm waiting for that. But beyond that, I'm looking up and I'm saying, Lord, come. It's okay. The best place to meet that baby would be in heaven, in your presence, not here on this earth. How many of you know I'm just pilgrim, passing through? I don't belong here. We're just, this is a tent. This is why Abraham lived in tents. You have a house, it might be pretty nice, but it's just a tent. You're not going to be here, you know, you, you may be here for 90 years if you're healthy. But it's just a tent, and we're just passing through. I'm looking, as Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. You don't want a city whose builder and maker is Gavin. You don't want a city whose builder and maker is, you fill in the blank, any human being. You don't. Neither did Abraham. We want a city whose builder and maker is God. And that's heaven. And praise God, He's coming back. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for saving me. That song is a great reminder, isn't it? And that chapter, chapter 13, Paul's first sermon there, it's encouraging because he knew the gospel. He knew the gospel message. He could sum up the book of Joshua in one verse, in the book of Deuteronomy, and, and Numbers, in a couple verses, he just knew the Word of God. He was a man who knew the Word of God, and it clicked. See, the synagogue, those guys in the synagogue, they open it up and just kind of, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen that. Da -de -da -da. Da -de -da -da. Monty Python, Holy Grail. They're walking along. Da, da. They're chanting things. And people did that. People still do that. It's called religion. It's called tradition. Ritual. And what we what makes this life come to life, or what makes this book come to life, is when he causes you to come to life. And you understand, my Redeemer lives. Like Job declared. <laughs> like, like Paul knew. He lives. This book is alive. It's not just a novel. It's not just 
some words on a page. This stuff is food for our soul, for the spiritual man. The, and it shows you what your soul is and what your flesh is, mm-hmm. what's spiritual and what is carnal. And it's, it's exciting as we go through the Word of God. Amen? Amen? So let's continue to sing, sing praises to Him for He's, he's good. Amen? Amen? Lord, thank You that You hear us even when we sing to You. Lord, that You hear our hearts, Lord, and You hear our prayers when we just cry out to You from our hearts. We thank You for this time together.